Good evening and thank you for coming along tonight. My name is Nick Button-Brown and I'm Chair of the Games Committee here at BAFTA. BAFTA as a charity is set up to support the games industry, to promote the best of the content that we have, to encourage new people into the industry and to help those people succeed. We're here tonight to celebrate creative excellence. So I'm gonna hand over to our host for the evening, Rob Pardo. Hello everyone, I'm very honored to be here to uh, help BAFTA honor Mark and Brandon and Riot Games. Uh, it's obviously an amazing company that's just turned 10 years old. So the first thing I want to do before um, I have Mark and Brandon come up is uh, they prepared a video that kind of talks about the last 10 years of Riot. 10 years ago, right, there was no Riot. There was no League of Legends. And, you know, looking back on all the great things the community has accomplished and the awesome stuff that's been created, it's just mind blowing. Mark and I were sort of a niche of gamers back in an era when most things were single player and most games were sort of sold at stores. And we were early members of lots of online game communities, whether it was Dragon Realms in Brandon's case or you know Ultima Online and EverQuest in my case. He was in the top 100 of the original StarCraft ladder. And uh, we just loved connecting online with people around games and being competitive and you know going deep. We wanted to build a company that would really try to put the player first and, and care deeply and forge a, a great relationship with gamers. The, the journey here has been full of scary moments, especially like in the early days, like there were moments when we had a team when suddenly we're responsible for people's livelihoods and like, are we gonna be able to sort of hit the next milestone so we can make payroll? Are we gonna actually make a game that is gonna be worth playing? Those early beta days, you know, there's probably a couple hundred players in our whole community at the time and maybe 30 or 40 of them would show up and you start to see the same names. I would just always think to myself like how is it that these guys like want to be here like in this game like when's the shoe gonna drop like there's so many bugs we have so many challenges there's so many things we're working on it felt like a loyalty that we didn't deserve. For me like the moment when all the growth of the community felt tangible it was really the season two worlds. Just walking into that and looking around and seeing, you know, League of Legends fans, they have signs and they're just screaming and they have jerseys on and it was just like, holy shit, this is awesome. And it just, I think those types of moments made us want to do more for the community and try to, you know, create even cooler opportunities. It's so rewarding, you know, to see the passion Players do things with our champions we'd never even imagined, and the designers didn't imagine. And we sort of evolved that understanding together with the community. Oh, the flash hook! The big got him! Xiao Wei Xiao goes down! You know, when the community creates a piece of content that just like totally makes you smile or laugh, I think what they do for us is they just like drive this this need to sort of live up to the expectations. We gotta be worthy of this kind of passion. Sometimes we spend so much time thinking about features, developing something, and we, that we lose perspective, yeah. and the community can just keep us honest. And those are the times when we try to really acknowledge, you know, our mistakes and get better. You know, I think we both probably feel a, a tremendous amount of gratitude for the incredible ride we've sort of had together and the, the uh, moments that we've been touched by, you know, meeting players and seeing their passion for League and appreciation for a lot of the things, you know, Rise done. I mean, they've helped us grow as people and as individuals incredibly. The, the gratitude that we have is just, there's no amount of words that could express it. Best thing to do is just start at the beginning. When did, uh, when did you guys meet? <laughs> well, we became friends in uh, college days, not too far from here down at uh, USC. Um, both of us are Trojans and, uh, you know, we um, kind of bonded over gaming, really. Like that was our sort of shared passion and we ended up becoming roommates after college uh, and we went and lived together like literally less than a mile from here um, in West Hollywood in an in a, in a apartment nearby. and. Um, it was there that, that Riot was actually founded. So. so that's a big step, though, from you know being 
friends at USC to actually becoming business partner, partners and founding a big game company? Like, was there a step where you guys knew that that was the right thing to do? You know, it's interesting. The, uh, the first business plan that Brandon and I actually worked on uh, was not Riot Games, but uh, when we were like 18, 19 at USC, uh, we worked on a business plan to build an esports league. Uh, so, you know, kind of ironic. We're going to call it UGL, the Ultimate Gaming League. And, uh, you know, just kind of fun to see how things have worked out. But, uh, you know, I guess the bond, you know, that really helped create Riot really was this bond over games and, um, you know, really a desire to sort of relate to players. Like, we felt that we were hardcore players that wanted to really go deep into online games. And, you know, a lot of times, uh, a lot of the games that we were playing at the time, the development teams would sort of move off of, you know, working on, you know, let's say StarCraft, you know, or, you know, Warcraft 3, you know, amazing titles that you, of course, worked on, which we are huge fans of, so thank you. Um, and, you know, we're like, we want more StarCraft. You know, don't, work, don't move the development team off onto StarCraft 2, right? Please connect and, you know, help expand this thing that we love because we'd spend hundreds of hours, thousands of hours. And, um, you know, so we, we thought that that sort of represented an opportunity. And, um, you know, and I think some of those experiences really helped form sort of the basis that created Riot. So I think that's really interesting because you guys have always been super player focused and obviously it's the whole point of the company. Um, but I mean, I, I guess, uh, you know, like why League of Legends, why Riot? Like, I mean, you're kind of coming from this esports point of view, you know, being gamers, but you have to pick a lane. You know, you have to pick that first game and, you know, you have this idea of the head of what's the game and what's the company you want to create. He goes mid, I go bottom. <laughs> it's league uh, reference. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no. It, the uh, the uh, it's yeah. It, it's it's sometimes a league reference. Um, okay. No. True. <laughs> the, the 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 true nature of our bond is uh, for another day. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, and look, we used to play a lot of games in the. We, we played a lot of MMOs, but our other favorite games to play were sort of session-based competitive experiences, especially if they were like cooperative, where we could sort of play together. So. StarCraft was a, was a huge one for us. Um, Warcraft 3, Dota, a lot of the, 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 the games in sort of the mod scenes were, were really, I think, where we sort of spent, it a, lot, spent a, a lot of our time. And we wanted to build games for players that we related to, like for players like us. And, and so, that, so the goal was to build very competitive, cooperative kinds of experiences that you could just run around and kick ass with your friends. And a lot of those games, um, if they didn't have a, if they weren't an MMO, they had a, they didn't have a subscription model or any sort of online model. So at the time, publishers were sort of driven to release a new package goods, a new SKU, sort of at retail at Walmart, and that meant that it was sort of hard to support your hardest core community that was happy to play hundreds or thousands of hours of your game, like us, um, when you're sort of always racing to, to build the next one. And we we really wanted to sort of focus on, on, on those kinds of players. The other thing too that I'll just I'll add to that um, is, you know, as early and sort of, you know, hardcore members of uh, MMO communities, you know, I was a really hardcore EverQuest player as an example, you know, we were those players who would, spe you know, stay up late, spend hundreds of hours. You know, at one point I was probably playing 80 hours a week, you know, not going to school, you know, very like, or not going to class very frequently. Um, you know, EverQuest is kind of what I did, and I had a lot of passion for the game. And so, you know, I'd write these message message board posts, you know, trying to plead to Sony as a developer, like, hey, here's what I think is wrong with the game, because you cared so deeply about the community and you're investing, you know, I led a guild, doing things like that. And, um, you know, at one point, I actually won a permadeath PvP competition in EverQuest, uh, where they had promised to name an item after the winners, and you know, 29,000 people made accounts, it was a big deal. Uh, and so I was super excited, and it was this incredible challenge, you know, killed like 180 players and didn't die once, uh, which is pretty <laughs> hardcore in an EverQuest uh, experience. And, uh, and then they just didn't follow through, you know, in terms of, you know, delivering the item and, and things like that. And that type of experience turned me from an evangelist into somewhat of a detractor. I was so hurt. You know, it's like, I think those types of formative experiences are when we, you know, write these big message board posts, be like, working as intended, you know, that felt very tone deaf or whatnot. We're like, why? You know, and obviously we have a lot more appreciation for the challenges of game development now and publishing. And, you know, we obviously don't 
uh, bat a thousand in terms of you know delivering uh, what our players would want, you know. But I think that type of empathy, in order to sort of really relate deeply to those types of experiences, some of the experiences that motivate us to try to come up with better ways or just sort of different ways to not let our players down. Right. Well, as a side note, I also would would send notes to Sony about stuff that that I thought <laughs> they should be doing and. Uh, and then my bosses at Blizzard got mad and told me to stop doing that. Well, <laughs> and that worked out well. <laughs> so you so solved took, them directly. In a different way. Took it yeah. into your own hands. You said, you know what, let's just, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so I get the whole thing of we're gamers, we see this audience that's gonna be served, so, so if I get this straight, your whole idea is a couple guys that are out of college, that are ever in the game industry, is gonna go make a game that's gonna have endless support and we're gonna make it free to play. Yes. Well, it, it is sort of, uh, yeah, you bring up a good point. Uh, like the uh, naive optimism, you know, I think is one of the things that we're incredibly grateful for. Uh, you know, Brandon and I like to joke that if we knew then what we knew now, we probably wouldn't have done it. Um, we also like to joke we wouldn't have invested in ourselves back in the day because, you know, it's so utterly improbable. We really made every mistake you could possibly do. Um, I don't know if you want to highlight any particular mistakes or whatnot, but... It's a, it's a miracle. Like, yeah. well, I would just love to hear a little bit about that kind of experience of, okay, I mean, you're going to go pitch investors and you have to raise money to go do this game company. I mean, how are you guys able to pull that off? It was tricky, right? Because you don't want to come off as like the, like the 24 and 25 year old kids that are asking for millions of dollars from investors to go make their dream game, right? <laughs> like, like that is, uh, you know, I, you know, I think that that wouldn't have been particularly mm -hmm. compelling, and and so we just we went, you know, we went step by step. We tried to sort of really articulate in in the clearest and simplest possible form, like why this would work for somebody who didn't understand games and couldn't relate to the passion that we had, but mm -hmm. could sort of you know relate in some tangential way. Um, and so, I mean, it was an adventure. Like it will, you know, raising. Financing was not easy for us, right? It was not like venture capitalists were just like writing blank checks and, and calling us all the time. It was, uh, it was like a slog to sort of try to find people that would even give us the time of day and sit and meet with us. And so we, we went step by step. I think we raised five rounds of capital along the way. And, um, and in the meantime, we were trying to build a team with no you know, experience as, as leaders, as game developers, as really anything. Um, and convince people to go on this crazy journey with us to build something that didn't make sense to a lot of people. What? You're not putting it on console, right? And in 06, yeah. the the whole idea was like PC was dying and no single player. And you're going to sell digital campaign? dolls to males that are going to spend money online. What? You're going to give it away for free and like yeah, like yeah. it's uh, many of our top people, some of which who are in the audience uh, today, you know, told us no, of course, because they had great jobs and like why would they leave great companies like Blizzard or wherever to come work with two no names. And it, it took a while. It was it was an evolution, right? Our first like handful of hires were, were primarily found on Craigslist, right? <laughs> like, like, um, and uh, do not underestimate <laughs> Craigslist, though. <laughs> we but we learned and we grew together, you know. And it was it was full of mistakes, um, but but just an attitude around getting. And by the way, to Mark's earlier point around like the importance of this sort of naivete that we had, it it it, it allowed us to be completely unburdened by a sort of conventional wisdom. And really ask the dumbest, simplest questions about how things are done or why they're done that way. Um, but it allowed us, it freed us to think differently about how to develop games, about how to deliver games in, in ways that kind of got us laughed out of publishing meetings on multiple occasions. But it also, but it turned us into a publisher that did things differently. And right. so. I mean, was that a lot of the reason why you guys developed your own publishing platform and kind of went that direction? Was, you know, you just want to do it your own way and you couldn't get someone else to kind of agree with the way that you guys were thinking about being player focused? Well, we, we actually did talk to a number of different publishers at the time as well. And uh, one of the reactions, sort of the reaction we had to those conversations was, oh my God, right? Like they actually have no idea what we're talking about. Uh, and so we were worried that if we handed over the keys of the kingdom, that we would fail, essentially sort of sign up, be guaranteed to fail. But originally we didn't aspire to be a publisher. We just wanted to make a game and try to deliver it in a particular way. But in order to do an online service appropriately, you sort of need to think about the whole value chain and the whole end-to-end -end experience. And uh, that, therefore, increased the scope and increased the difficulty quite a bit, which uh, you know, meant that we had to go build our own publishing business, needed to figure that out, needed to build our own platform. Uh, you know, Back-end technology in the middleware market was not nearly as mature as it is today. 
And, uh, you know, a lot of those sort of historical facts are one of the reasons that we struggled out the gates from a launch standpoint. And when the game started to, you know, do better, you know, we had a lot of downtime and service issues and, you know, because we, uh, we really were a ragtag team that, uh, you know, spent pretty much every dollar we possibly could on trying to invest in the product and, uh, you know, really had to sort of build the plane while flying, uh, sort of a metaphor we were constantly using in the company. So. Okay, so what about those uh, early days, like right after you launched? Like, what was that like? And when was it that you suddenly, that you started feeling successful? Because I know, yeah, there's that rocky time period. It wasn't like you guys launched and then suddenly money started raining from the sky. Yeah, we weren't Pokemon Go. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it didn't happen fast. And it was like, um, you know, they talk about sort of like the sort of proverbial hockey stick of growth, right? That only happened if you zoom out really, really, really far over a long time period, right? But what, what it really was, was month over month was very slow and steady growth. Pl and the reason was players were sticking with us. So we had, we had extremely loyal players who would recruit their friends. We had almost no budget for advertising. And it was almost the kind of game you couldn't advertise because it was like, it was a genre that most people had never heard of, that didn't understand, a no-name developer, a no-name game. And a really hard and niche game. Like we were, we made a very uncompromising game. We weren't trying to make a game that was going to be broadly accessible. Um, and even today, like after years of polishing it, it's still very hard to play. And it's very, and, and that was okay. We were doubling down on, on again, a very niche audience. But mm -hmm. over time, that audience just stuck with us and recruited their friends. And that sort of six percent this month, eight percent that month, started to compound. Were there any decisions, kind of in in that kind of era, where you feel like you know, really helped you get to that success point? I think there, there's a bunch of things, but one in particular was, uh, or I guess I like two that were related. One was our frequent patch cadence. So we committed, and this was a very painful experience for all the developers in the room that were at the time. I remember, you know, Dave Banks is an example. We had many debates about uh, this type of challenge, uh, you know, and Scott Gelb, right, and, you know, we were, we were sort of mandating that we needed to have a two-week patch cadence. Um, and especially with our relatively immature engine and content tools and platform technology, that was a huge burden for the team. Uh, but we needed to essentially engineer hope with our players by having this direct you know, relationship with them that, yes, we hear you, we understand there's a bunch of problems in the game, we acknowledge those, and look, we're going to get better. And so every patch, improvements, right? And so players really started to believe that, wow, my feedback matters, Riot's listening to me, I see improvement, cool, I'm gonna stick around, it's sort of worth my time because I see where it's going and I believe in sort of the nuts and bolts of the game and I feel special being part of this community. And I think that core group became the evangelists that sort of helped bring in their friends and enable the game to continue to grow sort of virally. Cool, so um, at what point did esports become important to you guys? <laughs> it's interesting, you know, we, we always, like when we were building the game, we always knew that that what was fun about the game was that it was a that it was sort of a competitive sport. It was an experience. The analogy we used was sort of building an arena, and but we actually didn't think that esports were going to be a big thing. We didn't think there were going to be a lot of players that were going to be all that enthused about spectating mm -hmm. versus playing. Um, you know, in, in a ratio that like that that was sort of analogous to sports. And so it it happened kind of as a surprise. The more we built up. We eventually added rank to the game and sort of a ladder, and um, and it was only natural that the, the top teams on the ladder would get an opportunity to sort of like play against each other and started hosting those events and those tournaments. But it was only after we started to get feedback in the form of like viewership from those events that like we realized, holy moly, like a huge percentage of our audience mm -hmm. is actually engaging for long periods of time. And so that was ultimately, that was really sort of season two, right? And it was like... Um, Right, well, season one, the sort season of results. Season one finals. Yeah. Season one finals, yeah. I think yeah. A, what is it, a million people. And also, part yeah. of it was that was the same exact time right. that streaming. Twitch and streaming was sort of happening as an innovation. And so, um, you know, we, we streamed on Twitch and own 3D and all that stuff, um, the season one finals. And yeah, like 100,000 concurrence and a million people tuned in over, you know, when there was like 50 people in folding chairs in the actual live audience. So. Yeah, we kind of had the, so in some ways, the right product at the right time for the viewership experience for video games and for esports to become a thing. Um, and, I, you know, I think that was rather fortuitous. 
So there's lots of uh, competitive games that are kind of in the esports scene, but you know, clearly League has been way more popular than most of the others. Like, what do you think special about League or special about the way you guys manage League that has allowed it to really become such a bigger esport than almost anybody else? Well, I think you know one of the things that matters most for an esport from our perspective is the viewership experience, right? Who wants to watch other people play? Uh, and so the first thing that's really helpful there is to have a large install base, right? people who actually are playing the game and care about the game, because that tends to be the core audience which will want to want to watch. Uh, and then I think you know another thing that was really helpful that the LCS really helped to pioneer, which is the League Championship Series, which is uh, the the league format that you know Riot helped develop, um, was we made it much more viewable for a fan to know when matches are going to happen, know who the players are, know who the teams were, and just establish a relationship uh, by publishing the schedule way in advance. So historically, a lot of esports tournaments were organized over the weekend, and you kind of didn't know exactly who was going to play who at what time or which players are going to go, and sort of oftentimes invitationals. And uh, whereas when we had a much more rigorously planned, structured league format, people could know, okay, there's CLG and there's TSM, and they're going to play on Thursday night at you know 6 p.m., and you know, that really helped, uh, I think, fans attach uh, and develop fandom, and then we sort of evolved that uh, over time as well. And, and similar to a game, like it's also a mindset around why you're building the sport and like why you're because you, you, you as a developer you don't get to decide like, hey, my game is going to be a sport, right? The fans mm -hmm. and the players ultimately decide that. It's a collaborative process where you're working together each step of the way to sort of get feedback on how players are reacting. You're building it together. And the best way to do it, I think, is to be able to deeply relate to them, right? Like mm -hmm. only put people in your esports group that, that are super fans of the sport mm -hmm. themselves that can deeply relate to what the experience is like and, and how players are reacting as players themselves. And, and then you get to build it with, with you get to build it with it, but you can't be hyper prescriptive around like this. And, and we've, we've done that on occasion, like to a fault, I think, and it's always um, been a lesson. Yeah. Yeah, and we're sort of learning and still evolving the format. I mean, we have 13 leagues around the world now. You know, Riot runs about a little, a little over half of them. Uh, you know, so we're partnering with a, a number of different groups, such as OGN in Korea, uh, you know, the LPL down in China, you know, or in Southeast Asia, you know, different regions like that. Um, you know, and I think one other thing that really helped us was the ability to invest way ahead of where sort of the economics were from sort of a you know market or you know advertising perspective because the thing that we were focused on was trying to deliver a great player experience a great fan experience um, and you know that allowed us to essentially subsidize the growth of this you know great league uh, you know in a way that we wouldn't have been able to done you know do if league uh, didn't have the size of player base that it has so you guys have built this amazing game, League of Legends, and you're building out this huge eSport, but let's talk a little more about Riot. So, you know, I know you guys are, are very focused on kind of the company culture, and you've scaled this company in 10 years from zero to, where are you guys at now, like 3,000-ish people? Close. Somewhere in there. Yeah. Um, so maybe talk about some of the key things you did along the way to, to attain that sort of scale, and what you're trying to do to, to maintain your culture in the spat, in, in spite of the fact of growing so quickly. Right, yeah, because because that skill is never a goal. That skill is very difficult, and it's not, um, you know, I think every, there's a number of writers here in the audience, I think every one of us wishes the company could do what we do with less people, like w wish we were smaller. It's a lot of, it's an enormous distraction, and it's very challenging to operate at a large scale. Um, it's kind of like in Warcraft 3, if you have too many units on the Upkeep. board, you start to eco slowly, <laughs> right? Like, um, and, Four and, gold. And it's like, it's, um, but it just means more, getting more people on the same page. Um, and when you're, when you're a creative company and you're, and you're building, you know, IPs and worlds and games from scratch and you're, you know, it, it's hard to keep everyone in, in alignment. So I think w that's sort of been a key word for us is like finding mechanisms and tools um, to sort of keep the company on the same page at scale. And for us, it's been an enormous focus on culture, bringing people on board who share our d most deeply held core values around serving players, around loving games, around having the ability to be genuinely empathetic um, and, and, and really care about our audience. And if we have that in common, then, then we can start to solve a lot of the rest. But, but it, it, is, it is a challenge. And, and the only reason we have 3,000 people is because 
at this moment, like that's what we feel like we need to have to be able to sort of execute on, on the various goals that, that we've set, but it's difficult. But in game development, is of course, it, it's entirely a team sport, right? Like there are so many people that need to, you know, you need to have all stars at every single position um, for the game to go well. It doesn't matter how fun it is if people can't log in to play it. Right? It doesn't matter how great the design is or you know, if everybody thinks the art looks so terrible that never, you know, no one gets attracted to the game, et cetera. Uh, you know, and if the technology falls over, may as well go home. And uh, you know, we all know production only orders pizza, but no, I'm just kidding. Uh, we, like, <laughs> we like to self-identify as production people. That's why we can make those jokes. But um, you know, so as a result, we historically had a huge focus on both individuals, like trying to find, to Brandon's point, trying to find people who have the incredibly intrinsic motivation that don't want to join Riot because they think it's great for their career, right? Oh, what could benefit me? Like, oh, you're this fast growing company with this interesting thing. Like I could learn so much there. That is the, okay, thank you, go somewhere else. We want people who are really driven to deliver great things to players or you know, who are essentially, we perceive ourselves as a mission driven company. Um, you know, where we say that we aspire to be the most player-focused game company in the world. And that is a rallying cry for rioters, right? Like, we want people, and we feel this, and everybody, you know, every rioter in the room relates to this deeply. When our servers go down or we disappoint players or we do a thing, you know, we release some content and players aren't incredibly excited, we want to feel that pain. We want to, we want people that want to feel that pain, that agonize over it, that want to do a better job. Um, and we so think we can back teach to the skills because they can't yeah. sleep that night because you know we 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 you know this, there's a player facing issue on live. And again, that's not to say that you know we want everybody to, you know to crunch all day or things like that. Like we actually you know try to invest a ton in creating a very supportive company, and you know we're not a FaceTime place, you know, etc. Uh, because we think we need great people that are sort of at their best uh, to do great things and to create incredible experiences for players. But again, absent that passion, nothing else really matters, right? Like you can be the most brilliant person, you know, incredible technical expert, but you're not going to have that X factor that helps you really create things that, from our perspective, resonate deeply with the players you're trying to serve. I mean, many of the best ideas in the game or at Riot in general have come from people that don't have the tremendous resumes, you know, that mm -hmm. are players, essentially. So outside of um, caring deeply about the player, are there other traits that you think make people successful at Riot? So another is, uh, you know, we like to say no brilliant jerks. You know, so people, again, that are sort of motivated by self uh, and don't want to collaborate effectively with other great people who are willing to challenge them to help them get better, right? Because again, at the end of the day, it's not about us, it's about our players, which means people need to be open to being challenged and so they, all of their ideas should be safe to be socialized and being challenged by the interns to us, to you know, various leaders all over the place. And if people don't have the humility to do that, again, we don't want them either because we need teams to mm -hmm. create great, great experiences. Um, and you know, people that tend to be driven by self more than other things, you know, from our experience, uh, tend to not make great teammates. What's like a, one of the biggest challenges you guys are having kind of with the riot culture and things that you want to continue to evolve to change? People want to water it down. Uh, so at scale, we feel pressure from people who, uh, you know, as we add more and more nodes to the ecosystem, want to say, well, you know, hey, we say that we only hire gamers, right? Like, really? Does that mean, like, well, I, like, how do we define gamer and what does that term mean? And, you know, there, there is a, it is obviously a squishy term. Um, and Riot tries to be intentionally uncompromising and unapologetic about, yeah, we are black licorice, right? We are not for everybody. We are serving a niche audience. Uh, you know, we are very hardcore what we do. We are not Facebook or Google where we're trying to build something that the whole world can enjoy. We are very focused, which means we want people that are very narrow in their sort of interests, you know, et cetera. Those people, of course, can come from all sorts of diverse backgrounds from all over the world. We're an international company with 20 offices in, you know, in different places around the world. We're you know, our headquartered in Santa Monica. Um, you know, we have great diversity of thought also in particular because we want people to challenge you know, each other. Uh, but we feel pressure frequently around that dynamic. And, you know, so which is one of the reasons we try to invest a lot in defining our culture, 
educating people that are you know interested in Riot about the dark side of the company as well. Uh, so you know we were recognized as one of the great places to work by Forbes. You know, and we're Fortune. or Fortune rather, sorry, and we're not going to apply for that anymore because we get a spike in applications, and it's the wrong applications, right? It's people that want to come to the company more from a self-interested perspective as opposed to a player interest perspective. Whereas people that know us because of league and because of the dynamics, they tend to make the best riders. Interesting. I think it's very different when you're like an early company and you know, you're kind of the underdog and you'd be scrappy and yeah. you, know, you just don't have that many expectations. Um, and I think oftentimes it's easier to be the underdog than when you're now the big favorite. Everyone's looking to you for industry leadership. They want to know what the next game you guys are doing, what the next event is. I mean, has that changed anything for you guys personally or so, for the studio? You know, it's funny. We used to say, it, we're like, oh my God, if, if we're you, how do you release StarCraft II? The sequel to the best PC game in the history of the world. Oh my God, that'd be, that'd be so difficult. You know, so. That was challenging. Yes. Was. You know, like, <laughs> That's why I ask you guys the question. Yeah, exactly. You're in the hot seat. <laughs> Look, there's a set of expectations now, and but it is way, it was way harder to be the underdog, oh. right? Like, we didn't know what we were doing. Like, we often reminisce probably too much about the good old days and, and when, you know, when we were 35, you know, people in this Motley crew and all the good times we had together and all the crazy stuff, but, but it was way harder back then. Like, mm -hmm. we, we didn't have enough resources. We didn't have enough expertise. We didn't know what the heck we were doing. Now we get to collaborate with such incredible, such incredible people. The team is so talented um, that so I, I don't I don't long for the early days, and I don't think that that it is that it is anywhere near as challenging as it was back then. Honestly, and you're and you're in the throes of that now, right? As yeah. you know, in, in your in world. And, um, and uh, but but it is hard, and it's a different set of challenges, and we're trying to sort of adjust to 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 that world, and it it is it does feel weird. Right, it feels weird being like an incumbent company in our mm -hmm. in our world, whatever that means. Um, and and uh, I think the key is to just not forget why we're here. Why did we Why did we all set out to do this? Um, and we, we we will just we have to stay focused, never leave those players behind, and not feel um, this sort of like desire to sort of chase growth or be broad and be something for everyone, because then we'll lose our soul. And to that point, right, as we think about future products and, and things like that. You know, we're, we are trying to have the definition of success, you know, not be oriented around, you know, simply like big numbers and commercial success. Like we are focused again from a player perspective around, we think that there's an audience that we see, right, a bunch of players that have a need from a, you know, that we think we can deliver great experience to, and we want to do that, right? And if that happens to be niche, but accomplish that great, that goal, great. Whereas if something has a big commercial success, but actually is sort of perceived as a bit of a me too, or, or not you know, something that is meaningful or long lasting, or sort of solves a meaningful problem for players, we're actually being more disappointed in that scenario. You know, and that's something that oftentimes also requires a lot of reinforcement internally, because that's a pretty unconventional concept as well. Uh, but we, we believe and hope that uh, after we get a couple other titles on our belt, under our belt, you know, it'll be easier to appreciate. Yeah, so maybe um, talk a little about what you guys see as the future for Riot. Like, how far out do you guys kind of plan or dream? You know, five years, 10 years, 20 years? Like, <laughs> like what do you guys kind of see for the future? What are your hopes and dreams? I think it's, I, th I think a little bit of everything across those horizons, but I think at the end of the day, like, there's a lot of blocking and tackling right in front of us, and there, mm -hmm. You know, and, and we've been we've been extremely focused, right? Like earlier, we talked about how, you know, like we started this place so that we didn't leave gamers like us behind, and, and we've been relentlessly focused on that goal. And you know, we'll invest probably more hours into the development of League of Legends, like this year on its seventh or eighth anniversary than than we did during development, right? You know, and but um, but obviously we will make more games, right? The S and Riot games that's currently. Um, just a, a, an aspiration will, will become a reality at some point. Um, and, um, you know, and, and I think we want to be a, a company that releases you know, a few really thoughtful games with a lot of care and a lot of love, um, and, um, and that players can sort of expect that from us each time we release something new, and that there's going to be a, a, a lot of ongoing support, and we're going to be 
you know, we're going to build the game once it's launched together with our community each and every time. So what do you, do you, I know it's too early because you are just right game still, but I mean, when you start thinking about your future products, you know, what do you think are going to be, you know, characteristics of that? Like, are they all going to be esports or are they all multiplayer? I mean, or does it matter? They, they certainly won't all be esports. Um, I think, you know, that will only be appropriate for, for games that truly, you know, belong there. And I think that, again, that's sort of like not up, up to us as developers to, to, mm -hmm. to decide. Even beyond that, I think um, what, it, what they will have in common is, I think, that, you know, they'll be focused on, on players, a common audience who, who really love games, who are very serious about games, and in particular have a bent towards playing games that are rich and deep, um, and playing with their friends, sort of socially, either cooperatively or competitively, um, or both at the same time. Um, so I think you know if that narrows it down. The other thing I would just add to that is you know we we think about it from a experiential perspective. So if any game can be augmented, enhanced by building around game experiences, some of which we could even solve with manpower or something like other mediums or whatnot, we were absolutely willing to do that. And that's essentially how esports evolved, was we believe, like, we sort of think about it like a feature. And I think we would aspire to try to take the same approach to any other title. Uh, so maybe it won't be esports that may augment a particular game, but there could be other things that could help enhance and differentiate. You know, again, I think, um, like personally, and I think probably a lot of people in the audience think, you know, you guys' story is very inspirational, and you know, get to know you guys. You know, I think it's well founded. I don't think it's an accident that you guys got to where you're at. Um, but I think it's also a great story just for the game industry. You know, that you guys were able to do this as you know, kind of a player community and being player fans, and then doing what you've done. Um, do you think there's lessons or things that you learned through doing that that would be inspirational, helpful to kind of the next versions of you coming out of USC or, or maybe UCLA? <laughs> My wife appreciates that comment. She, she's a Bruin. Um, I mean, I think it's, it is, look, we're all, everyone who works in games, I mean, we're lucky to get to work on games every day, right? Like, I mean, that's, that's already a blessing. But I think it's really important to work on games that we actually love um, and to not get overly caught up in, in loving the craft as it's sort of narrowly defined. You know, we all sort of get bucketed into our crafts, whether we're an artist or a game designer or whatever. But, but if we think about the product holistically and if we can truly love it and it's solving something that's important to us and near and dear to our heart, like, I think that is always reflected. Like, I think you can tell if a game team loved what they were working on, and I think it makes a huge difference. And so that may sound uh, idealistic or it may sound obvious, but either way, I think it's really impor you know, important from my perspective. Yeah, I think the, the other thing is, uh, you know, I think we always try to encourage people that want to go build a game or build a company to get out there and try, you know, or in, you know, whether it's get involved in mods or you know, just start doing things. Because you know, in our experience, there's you know, we really do believe that necessity is the mother of all invention. You know, all of the mistakes and lessons we've learned and improvements that have resulted as a result of those experiences are because we jumped in and because we tried. Um, and so, you know, I think that I think that if anybody's thinking about trying to follow their passion, uh, there's no better time in the history of games to go do it now. Also. Like, I mean, again, technology has advanced to a place where the cost of developing something great is l relatively low, uh, what, you know, because of great engines and, you know, content tools and, again, great, you know, abilities to, even if it's an online game, um, you know, the ability to sort of deploy that. And, uh, you know, so I think it's an awesome time for people to get started. And that's one of the reasons the indie scene has proliferated and grown so, so tremendously. Uh, and there's a ton of innovation happening in the indie scene. Obviously, it's somewhat difficult to then have that be successfully commercially, um, you know, which is an interesting challenge. But uh, again, you know, I don't think anybody ever regrets building a game um, and following their passion. So I wanted to bring it all the way back to, to you two guys again. And um, maybe have you guys talk a little about your partnership with each other and talk about each other and, and how what you've learned from each other and, and how you rely on each other to continue to do what you're doing. Well, it's, uh, 
I mean, at a certain point, it, it starts to feel like a marriage, right? Like you, we spend <laughs> as much time with each other as we spend with anyone in our lives. And you know, we've been at this together for 11 years. And before that, we were you know, very close friends and roommates. And you know, so it goes, it goes back much further. There's so many facets to a partnership. Like there's so many different things we can lean on each other on. And um, you know, I think without a doubt, like neither one of us could have done this um, individually. And so we, we really needed each other, and that feels good. It feels good to sort of be out in the trenches, like, you know, uh, fighting together. And, and um, you know, I can, from Mark, like, I, I've learned more from Mark than I probably have from anyone out there besides maybe my, you know, my, my parents or something. And, <laughs> um, and I learn something new every day, and there's, like, certain qualities that Mark has that I really just try to emulate and incorporate. Mark is just an incredible... Um, manager, an incredible leader, and um, just incredible architect of high-functioning teams, and a million other things. And um, and so there's, you know, Mark has helped me grow tremendously. And so that that's just an awesome opportunity. Well, to the point around team, right? Trust is the foundation of team, and I think one of the things that has really characterized uh, our partnership and why it's been successful was the ability for us to really deeply trust the other, uh, because. You know, as with any marriage, any relationship, you know, building a company, and there are so many different challenges, you know, and as entrepreneurs, right, you know, some days we thought we we're going to take over the world, and other days we thought, oh my God, how are we possibly going to get through whatever challenge? And, you know, being there to be able to pick each other up or sort of compliment each other, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, when somebody's going to focus on one thing, you know, we could go sort of divide and conquer was incredibly helpful. Um, and from an emotional support standpoint, also, uh, that was incredibly helpful, too, because it can be lonely, uh, you know, dealing with high-pressure situations, uh, you know, with the company, with players, you know, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, and I, I could sing Brandon's praises for, you know, a long period of time. Um, you know, I will say that Brandon is probably the smartest person I've ever met. Um, from the perspective, like the thing that's so fascinating about him, too, is he's kind of this weird oxymoron where he, Just the uh, moron. well, yeah, <laughs> that too, uh, yeah, but um, where he's simultaneously, he's got this incredible creative taste and streak and sort of vision and ability to sort of, he's sort, he very much has the reality distortion field thing, which is both some of his biggest strengths and also some of the biggest challenges that make him a bit of a pain at various times, but in the most endearing way. Um, which also, you know, again, when we were 24, right, he could, you know, sort of charm the pants off of the VCs we were talking to, right? Like just incredibly prepared, incredibly thoughtful, really intelligent, really sophisticated, right? Our business plan was 15 slides that were really well-polished pitch, which is a very difficult concept to explain at the time, by the way, because we were saying virtual goods and free to play and all this stuff. And people were like, and this is 2006, we were like, well, what are you talking about? Um, and, but we had about 200 slides of backup, right? And somebody would be like, well, what about blah, blah, blah. And we'd say, oh, that's a great question. If you refer to slide 176, we can see that, you know, it's like, okay, you guys are prepared. But that's all Brandon, right? Like I was, you know, he's the thoughtful, what are the million things that can go wrong? How do we think through every single possible scenario? You know, I was much more the run through walls. Let's go. We could like, it'll be fine. Let's figure it out. Um, you know, and I think <laughs> that, uh, that balance was really helpful. Uh, you know, but again, you know, it wasn't just sort of the business acumen. It's then also the sort of the, the creative capability and sort of, again, the willingness to think huge. Like once we started experimenting with esports, you know, Brandon was really going like, how, like what, let's go huge. And um, everybody at the team was like, really? You know, so, I mean, there's, and I could give dozens of examples of, of really sort of unconventional ideas that really, that B helped champion that helped define Riot and League of Legends as it is today. I think we're going to take some questions from the audience. Cool. Guys, what were your degrees and how did they help you with uh, running the business, setting it up? I studied uh, like at the undergraduate business program at SC and in the interactive media program and Mark, always yeah. said liberal arts. Yeah, I'm a liberal arts guy. I studied awesome. political science and minor in psychology, so nothing to do with games. You know, I looked at college, you know, I sort of undecided for two years. I had no idea what I wanted to study. And I always thought I'd go get a professional degree, you know, whether a law degree, you know, or go to business school or something. Um, and so what was interesting, though, is what I really got fascinated with in college was human motivation. So why do people do what they do? 
Uh, and so political science is sort of the macro level thinking about ideology, like why do groups believe what they believe and how does that motivate behavior? And then psychology at the micro level, like why would a person stab someone else? And uh, what is love? You know, these types of questions. <laughs> Again, very, very correct, right? And, um, but that, you know, human motivation I think is incredibly important for leadership and for building an organization as well as for game design. Um, you know, we like to think about why players are motivated to do certain actions and trying to design systems. In a nutshell, one of the things that, that dictates the quality of the experience you have in a game of League of Legends as much as, as anything else in the game is, is how other players, um, what your experience is with your teammates and your opponents. And so one of the things that we really focus on is trying to make those interactions as positive as possible and actually understand you know, the game's high pressure and you're relying on every individual on your team to make plays and work in, in really close harmony. And it's easy to sort of get, you know, tilted, sort of get, get off your game because you, you made a mistake and your team's letting you have it. Um, and it might be a total stranger on the internet, but they're, they're crushing you about the fact that you screwed up and you may or may not know you screwed up. And if you, but either way, like, how do you make that, you know, how do you encourage people to have great interactions? And, and um, how do you actually help players become more self-aware of their own behaviors, good and bad, um, and grow as teammates and players? And frankly, part of it is actually helping players understand that, that the better they are as teammates, the better they'll do, and the better their win rate. So players that, that are prone to being, you know, sh you know, talking a bunch of smack to their team and, and sort of getting tilted off the face of the earth when they play games, you know, end up uh, winning less games. So anyway, we do have a department that is full of um, psychologists and whatnot that, that, that are helping us sort of answer those questions um, as well. And then organizationally, uh, one thing too is, you know, at, because we scaled a lot, pretty much all of our senior leaders are in the biggest role they've ever had. Um, one of the things that we've resisted as we continue to grow the company was bringing in lots of sort of senior leadership from outside companies to sort of show us how to do everything, um, which is both good and bad. It's, it's been bad from the perspective of, because of our hiring bar is so precise around you need to be able to relate to our players, that narrows our talent pool. Uh, but it's been good from the perspective of, you know, a lot of really high potential people have grown and evolved, but it means that we, they need support. They need coaches. Oftentimes they need outside experts to help them think about how to level up their skills, you know, as leaders and things like that. And, you know, so we try to invest a lot in helping leaders grow, uh, which is another role that sometimes people with psychology backgrounds can help with. Uh, go ahead. Apart from, I mean, apart from these are big things, of course, apart from building a great game and being very engaged with your players and serving their experience. Can you talk a little bit about how you acquired players and audience in the in the formative stages of this? Was it primarily word of mouth and forums or did you find techniques to be able to engage and bring people in in such a noisy competitive market? There's not a lot we were able, we've tried a bunch of things to sort of like kind of market the game and bring players in, but but it's never, it's always been very difficult to do because the game is just so hard to play and the barriers to entry are so great. It's kind of like, how would you pitch your friend on reading a 10,000 page novel? Uh -huh. You know, your friend would be like, come on, like 10,000, I don't care how good it is. Especially right? if the first thousand pages suck. Right, right. right. yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and so it, it had to be, it had to be friends grabbing their buddies, kicking and screaming and dragging them through the learning curve. It's going to be worth it. We're going to have so much fun together. And so it, it just from the get-go had always just been sort of forums and referrals. And so... Um, did you identify those super advocates? Yeah, we did. And we actually put, we even put in mechanics to try to sort of encourage and make it easy to refer friends and provide rewards. Um, but ultimately, there's only so much you can do on that front. And we it's kind really, of screwed that up too, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> Yeah, we didn't do such a great job, but but the but but ultimately, like you know, the best thing we could do is just show players we're committed to the game, show players it was going to continue to evolve in the ways they wanted it to evolve, and um, you know, and and luckily, sort of, it's found uh, an audience really, like, uh, kind of on its own in in many respects. And again, I don't want to trivialize it, pretend we don't do, um, you know, broader publishing activities we do, but there's just a, I think eighty something plus percent of our players come through referral or organically. There's a weird kind of Venn diagram 
of passionate players that need to make software tweaks and change things, and competitive esports where there's real large money on the line. And how do you balance that, and how do you make the decision to actually implement something that could cost somebody literally hundreds of thousands of dollars? So that's a, that's a really challenging question. And the question essentially was the trade-off between balancing for all the players versus having a really robust pro scene where a change could potentially give a, one team an advantage over another based on their skills, et cetera, and therefore could cost real money. Uh, and how do we handle that? So I think uh, first is we try to acknowledge that that's the case and communicate that and not be shy about it to both pros and to players and to kind of make that built into the expectation of this is what it's like to play League of Legends. So, um, you know, that then obviously doesn't fully check the box or solve the problem, but at least it starts a discussion and a dialogue where we can engage team owners, players, pros, et cetera, into the conversation around, here's what we do, here's why. Are there ways to improve this? If so, we'd love your ideas. Uh, but then we try to do our best within that framework of making decisions that are truly in the best interest of the game uh, as a whole. And you know the nuances about how we make balance decisions or whatever you know is very tactical, um, but philosophically it starts with acknowledging that that's a challenge and um, trying to navigate that ambiguous optimal path between the different trade-offs. Um, and you know, it's it's not to say that we optimize for the pro scene or we optimize for every different player. We kind of do both depending on the situation. And at various points in time, that has made one audience angry uh, or the other, such as. Uh, a change that we made prior to Worlds of last year, where, uh, or maybe it's two Worlds ago now, you know, where we, we updated a bunch of characters at the same time as a Juggernaut patch. You know, and then we also changed a turret gold value, um, which then made lane swapping less of a uh, you know, meta strategy that teams could utilize. And so teams were furious that they spent you know, six months of the season perfecting the strategy, and now they're going into the World Championships and that strategy is essentially taken off the table because it was a, it was sort of bad for the game, made the game boring, uh, or more boring. And um, you know we're like, yeah, here's what happened, here's why, and sorry. You know one of the good things though is then that ended up being one of the bloodiest uh, you know tournaments we've seen in terms of player kills and whatnot, which made it very entertaining to watch. And so, but by being not being shy about acknowledging those different challenges and engaging the community in the conversation, you know I think that really helps uh, us deal with situations where there essentially is no perfect option. Any other questions? Who was the first character that you guys kind of came up with? And also, what are you most proud of? And the first character I remember like really discussing with you, Mark, was, was Annie. Yeah. And then I remember Singe being on the wall really yeah. early. I mean, it, those two are the characters that stick out the most for me in terms of, of, of our early, but like we sort of think of it in terms of like the first five, essentially. Yeah, the first five were essentially those two plus Sivir, Twisted Fate, and Alistar. Uh, and, and Alistar and Twisted Fate, Sivir, you know, all those characters, in, and then Ash, um, sorry, you know, was, uh, was the sixth. And um, a lot of those characters from a mechanic standpoint were relatively simple because the content tools we had for designers to create abilities were also incredibly simplistic at the time as well. Uh, so it's like stun block and direct damage and you know, uh, various things like that. So. But you know, with those characters have a special place in our heart, for sure. And then you had a question relating to what are we most proud of? Um, I think the team that we get to work with every day, it's like a, just a stunning, it's stunning to walk through the halls and just you know, be so blown away by your colleagues and like kind of both of us just are like walk by people's desks and see the, these like incredible creations that folks are working on that just like blow our minds and it's just it's a real privilege to get to work with such talented people. Well the uh, last part of my job for that the evening as the host is to uh, bring Nick back up here so that he can officially give Mark and Brandon their award. Thank you very much for coming along tonight and I'm delighted to present to you the BAFTA special award for the tremendous contribution you have given to our industry. <laughs> Thank you to BAFTA so much for this special recognition. This really is, is meaningful to, to both of us. And uh, on behalf of Brandon and myself, we really want to thank our team 
uh, and senior leaders that are here at Riot, and you know, we sort of graciously accept this on behalf of all of Riot. As we talked about, you know, game development really is a team sport, and uh, you know, Riot would not be here without all of the tremendous effort from all of you uh, and all the rioters at home. Uh, and then we also just like to thank you know Rob and our wives, you know, for being here uh, with us as well. My wife actually moved her flight to uh, to New York, where she has to go hop on the red eye to uh, to come to this. So thank you, honey, and thank you for all the support. And then last quick thing, but thank you to our players as well. You know, we thank truly you guys. Yeah. So, thank you.